Now listen. All the stories contained within here are retold as they were originally recounted and may not be suitable for youngins or those with a sensitive disposition. This here particular episode contains descriptions of hunting, skinning, preserving, and consuming animals. So listen to discretion is advised, y'all. Well, evening, y'all. It sure is a mighty fine fall night here in the holler. I don't know about you, but fall is my most favorite time of year. I just love it when the air turns crisp and cool and the shadows start growing darker and longer and you can just feel the world all around you getting ready for a long winter's rest. For me, fall always reminds me of sitting around a bonfire after the final harvest, all huddled up in all blankets, drinking apple cider and listening to folks tell Hank stories and folk tales. (laughs) <laughs> One of them stories that would always end up being told around that old bonfire every year was the legend of the Taily Pole. Now, I know, I know, putting it everybody these days has heard about the old Taily Pole. But the thing folks don't realize is that the original tale is much, much darker than they ever heard. You see, over the years, that old Taily Pole story has been watered down made easier for youngins to swallow, but y'all, the legend of the Taily Po ain't for the squeamish. They ain't no funny dog names, no silly rhymes, no vague endings, no, nothing like that. The original story of what happened out there deep in them woods, them dark North Georgia mountains, well, let's just say it ain't no bedtime tale, that's for sure. Now, The North Georgia mountains are vast and deep, and the perfect place to make a home if you're the sort of folk who prefers to be alone. (laughs) And the hermit, well, he was exactly that sort of man. (laughs) That old fellow was a bona fide mystery to all the folks in town. Nobody knew his name. Hell, nobody knew if he even had a name. Folks had just always called him the hermit for as long as anybody could remember. Nobody even knew where it came from, either, or how long the hermit had been up in them mountains. <laughs> For all anybody knew, the earth had just opened up one day and spit the fella out, whole and grown. The hermit was just... well, he just was. And that's all anybody ever knew. Well, now, the way I heard tell of it was, it had been a particularly hard summer in them mountains for everybody that year. There'd been a whole lot of heat and not nearly enough rain to keep everybody's crops from withering in the fields. And what little did survive the heat, well, it was mostly eaten up by critters. And by September, everybody knew it was going to be a very lean winter in them mountains for sure. And the hummer in particular was growing more anxious every day. Most all his summer supplies were gone and his traps had barely produced any game over the past month. And as the old fella walked home that evening with only a young hare for a supper slung over his shoulder, he knew he'd have to head down into town for winter supplies the next day in order to stand any sort of chance of surviving the harsh winter to come. Now, as most of you all know, the hermit had three red bone hounds that were his sole companions. That old fella loved those three dogs more than anything and would share his food and home with them like they were his very own children. The hermit smiled as he came into the clearing next to the stream where his little cabin sat and he called out for his three dogs to greet him. Only, the hounds didn't come. Well, that was highly unusual since the three of them dogs was very well trained to come and do what they were told. So the hermit laid down his gear and that young hare he'd caught up on the porch, and he walked towards the stream, calling for them hounds to come to him. And as the fella got closer to the stream, he noticed there was no cricket song, no frog calls, no night sounds at all. The dark woods all around him were still and quiet, like the trees was holding their breath. Well, word there was a wolf or a mountain lion might be stalking him, the hermit drew his knife out of his belt and he inched forward, calling out again for the dogs to come to him. Only the sound of the hermit's breathing could be heard in the still night air as he crept ever closer to the edge of the stream. 
Fear began to prickle at the old fellow's neck with an eerie feeling of hungry eyes watching him from some hidden place. Suddenly, from out of nowhere, two of his hounds came bounding up to the old hermit with their keen and howls, startling him plumb in or out of his skin. <laughs> the old fellow swore into his breath as he put his knife away and reached down and playfully scrubbed the two dogs. The hermit squinted out into the dark underbrush around him to see where the third of his hounds might be, and just barely caught a glimpse of him as the dog lifted his head up out of an old log. The hound whined and pawed at the log like he was trying to dislodge whatever creature he'd trapped inside it, but the old hermit was just too tired to wait around for the dog to claim his prize. And just as the old fella turned to leave the hound to his hunt, the dog cried out with an awful yelp and flew past the hermit towards the cabin like he'd been shot out of a cannon. Well now, the old fella raced home after the hound and found poor thing cowered up on the porch with five long, deep, nasty claw marks along the dog's muzzle. The hermit was confounded by not only the claw marks, but the hound's reaction as well. I mean, sure, raccoons have five claws, but damnation, he figured it'd have to be a mighty large raccoon to have made marks like that and to have scared a seasoned hunting dog that bad. Well, the hermit cleaned up the poor hound's wounds as best he could and stoked up the fire in the hearth and then set to skinning that young hare for his supper. Once he had it skinned and trimmed, the old fella cut the meat up for a watery stew and with what few supplies he had left in the larder, he put it all on the fire to boil. He divided what skin and bones and offal there was from the hare and gave it all to the hounds for what little supper he could provide for them. While the hermit waited for his stew, he thought back to that creature that the hound had trapped in that log, whatever it was, and sighed with regret that he hadn't at least taken a look at it when he had a chance. Together, the two of them might have caught a tasty something to keep all their bellies full for at least another day or two, if only he'd just gone over for a look. Hmm. Oh well. Now, after the hermit ate his watery stew, he set his bowl and the empty cooking pot down for the hounds to lick clean. Then he washed himself up and he got ready for bed. And as the old fella was just beginning to drift off to sleep, he heard a skittering, scratching sound rush across floorboards of the cabin. The hermit's eyes flew open wide and he shot straight up in that bed to look all around the dark cabin. Two of his hounds snapped to attention as well and began to growl where they laid on the floor in front of the fire. But the third wounded dog was curled up next to the bed and he began to whine with fear. Well, after several long moments, the cabin grew silent again as the hounds calmed down and the hermit's breathing slowed. The old fella laughed at himself as he settled back under the covers figuring his imagination was making monsters out of mice in the dark. But just as the hermit was settling into a comfortable, dreamy space, that skittering, scratching sound filled the silence of the cabin again. And again, the two hounds near the fire began to growl, while the one by the bedside whined in fear. The hermit sprang out of that bed and grabbed his knife up, and he stalked all around that small space, looking for the critter that kept the stub in his peace. And again, after several long moments of searching through the dark, the hermit couldn't find anything. And as he turned to make his way back to the bed, the old fella nearly broke his neck as he tripped over the wounded hound that was standing at his feet, as if the dog was trying to protect him. Well, he picked himself up off the floor, and the hermit noticed that the two other dogs were over at the bed, just a sniffing and pawing all around, like they was trying to climb up underneath it. Well, the old fella rushed over to the bed and pulled it up, frame and all, just in time to see a massive fur tail trying to wriggle down all into a hole in the floorboards. Well, without a thought, the hermit brought his knife down with a thwack on that big old bushy tail and cut it clean off of whatever critter it was attached to. A sickening ear pissing scream tore through the night and for a moment the hermit could have sworn the entire cabin shook from the terrible sound. 
all three hounds threw their heads back and howled long with that awful scream, and it took a good long while for the old fella to calm his companions down, especially that dog had been wounded. Eventually, though, the poor old hounds huddled up quietly next to the fire, and as the hermit began to examine the unusually long and sizable tail, not one of them dogs would come anywhere near it. Now, the hermit had spent nearly his entire life living off the land in them mountains, and he had never seen an animal with a tail like the one he was holding. That thing was nearly two feet long and as big round as the fellow's forearm. It was covered in thick, dark, oily fur and smelled like death itself, but the hermit figured with enough elbow grease the hide would clean right up to make a nice pair of gloves for winter. What caught the old fella's attention most, though, was the amount of meat the tail had on it. It's like nothing the hermit had ever seen before in all his living life. Why, there was just so much of it the old fella could cook some up right then to cure his hunger pains and then salt down the rest of it to help get him through the winter. And hell, the hermit figured after losing its tail, whatever critter had been attached to it was probably as good as dead by now. So he made a plan to track it down in the morning, and that way he could put the rest of the critter to good use for all the trouble he had caused him that evening. And as the hermit sat down to skin his prize and roast a bit of it up to fill his belly, he thought that maybe his luck was turning around after all. Well, by the time the hermit had crawled back into his bed later that night, his belly was so full he was tighter than a tick. That old fella couldn't believe how good the meat smelled as it roasted over the fire, and when he took his first bite, why, he thought he had done died and gone to heaven. Before he knew it, the hermit had eaten every single ounce of the meat off of that tail without saving any of it as he had intended. For a moment, the old fella felt bad for not sharing a bit of the delicious meat with his dogs, but <laughs> he decided giving them the bones was enough of a reward for helping him that night. At first, the three dogs sniffed well at the bones, but just as the hermit did, the hounds quickly devoured their treat ferociously and greedily. Sleep soon came to the old fella as he stretched out in his warm bed with a full belly thinking all about tracking down that nail tailless critter in the morning. The hermit's eyes flew wide open, but he couldn't see a thing. The cabin was completely pitch black. Why, the fire had somehow burned down the ash. The old fella tried to peer through the darkness to see where the voice had come from. Surely there was somebody outside. Why, there was no way anybody could get into the cabin without his dogs making a ruckus. Who, who's out there? The old fella called out. I ain't no mood to mess with you. You best take off, else I I'm gonna set my hounds on you. Scritching and scratching sound from earlier started up again right outside the cabin door, causing them hounds to jerk awake and begin to growl like earlier. The hermit slipped out of bed, and as he grabbed his knife, he snuck quietly to the door. The old fella put his hand on the knob, and he could hear that scritching and scratching getting louder the longer he stood there, his knees feeling wobbly with fear. Well, after a few minutes of listening to that terrible sound, the Hermit messed it up enough courage, and he jerked that door open with a wild cry of, Go get em, boys, and set them hounds loose into the night. For a while, the old fella could hear the dogs baying and howling out in the woods around the cabin as they tramped about, heads low, sniffing out their prey. But soon enough, the hounds went silent, and the two of them dashed back up on the porch, running back into the house as quick as a shot past the hermit standing in the wide open door. The old fella stood there for a few more minutes, looking out into the dark, calling for the last hound to come back, but that old dog never did. 
Fear began to prickle at the hermit's neck again like he'd done early in the evening when he felt like something was watching him from a hidden place. Quickly, the old fellow turned and shut the door and pushed the rusted, unused bolt into place to lock it tight. The hermit sank down into his chair next to the burned-out fire and stoked it up, not only to warm himself and his hounds, but to chase the shadows back into the deep corners of the cabin. Soon the tide of the day crept back up on the fella, and he crawled into bed to fall asleep again. The hermit shot up the second the whispers returned, louder and more forceful than before. He tried to search through the darkness to see the tormentor, but, like before, the cabin was pitch black, with the fire completely burned down to ash. The old fella jumped up out of bed and dashed to the door just as the scritching and scratching sound began again. The hermit unbolted the door and set his two hounds loose into the night, calling out, I ain't got your taily pole but my dogs are going to tear you apart if you don't get out of here. Then he slammed the door shut behind him and locked it tight. The old fella didn't bother stoking up the fire again. He just ran back over to his bed, grabbed up his knife, and slipped up under the covers like a child hiding in the dark. For a long time, he laid there listening to his two hounds baying and howling as they searched. Eventually, though, the hermit fell asleep, comforted by the thought that his dogs would keep him safe. The old fellow knew that the whispers weren't outside the cabin anymore. He screwed his eyes shut and started praying quietly that he'd wake up from this terrible nightmare. The hermit could swear that the scritching and scratching sound was so loud now that it was underneath the bed. whispers were angrier and more insistent than before and felt closer than ever, all while the scritching and scratching sound became more furious and terrifying. Suddenly the old fellow felt a weight pressed down on the end of his bed and the springs groaned with strain. The hermit's eyes flew open against his will to see the most gruesome sight anyone has ever seen. The first thing he saw was its eyes. They were as big as silver dollars and yellow like a mountain lion's, but they shined all on their own in the dark. Then, as the creature continued to slowly crawl over the end of the bed, the old fella could see dark, oily fur covering the broad face and muzzle with great tufts of fur on the long, upright ears that stood like horns on its head. The hermit began to sob when he saw the creature open its wide mouth in a knowing, evil grin to reveal two rows of long, needlepoint teeth. "'What in God's name do you want, you... you foul thing?' The hermit cried as he tried to push himself towards the head of the bed, but quickly he realized his attempts to move were useless when he saw that the creature had crouched on all fours on top of his legs, which gave the old fella his first real look at its entire hideous form. It was bigger than a full-grown black bear, but it was lean and muscular like it had been carved out of stone. It had thick, broad shoulders with powerful arms and paws that almost looked like hands and ended in long, razor-sharp claws that the hermit figured could easily take a man's head off in one swipe. The creature whispered in a hateful growl as putrid-smelling saliva dripped from its mouth. 
I, I don't have your taily pole, the hermit cried. I, I don't even know what a taily pole is. You took my taily pole, and I want it back. The creature dug its nasty claws into the old fellow's legs as it hissed and spat. The hermit's blood ran cold as ice. It finally dawned on him what the creature wanted. He knew what a taily pole was now, and there was no way for the fella to give it back. I, I ain't got your taily pole no more. I, I ate it up, and I fed the hounds to bones. All I has left is the skin hanging over there. Take it and go, demon. The creature's eyes flashed with the hunger of a predator circling its prey for a killing blow. Oh, I know. I've already got the skin and bones back. Now all I need is the meat. No! Well, it was late in the spring of the following year that folks in town started to notice that the hermit had never come down to get his winter supplies, and he still hadn't been down to stock up for a spring planting. Well, I mean, sure, he was a hermit, but that didn't mean that he wasn't a decent man, and nobody in town that would ever wish him harm. So half a dozen men decided they'd go up in them deep woods, up on them dark mountains, to check on the hermit's well-being. Now it's been told that the unusual silence in them woods all around the hermit's cabin told those men that something was terribly wrong before they ever set foot up on the porch. And the sight that greeted the men when they finally busted through the cabin's locked door, well, it was something none of them men would ever be able to forget. Oh, I could tell y'all about what they saw, about how some of them men had to rush out of the cabin for fear of losing their breakfast, but I don't think that's really necessary to you. Suffice to say, the hermit gave the meat back to the creature after all, and then some. Mm, that poor fella. What a terrible way to go. Mm, 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 mm. Anyway... Some of the men found what was left of the hermit's hounds while they was out catching their breath, and the whole group decided the fit and proper thing to do would be to bear them all together in a clearing next to the stream. And by the time the work was done, the sun had dipped well below the trees, and the shadows all throughout the woods had grown long and strange, making those fellas feel mighty uncomfortable and ready to get back to town right quick. Now, the men began to make their way back down the mountain just as they all felt a prickle of fear at the back of their necks, like they was being watched by hungry eyes from some hidden place. <laughs> well, I tell you what, those men hot-footed it back to town. Well, you know, for fear of them being late for their suppers. And as they lost sight of the hermit's cabin to the mountain's darkness, they all swore they could hear whispers calling out. Taily Taily Now I've got my Taily Hey y'all, I just wanted to say welcome and thank y'all for stopping by. I'm Miss Dahlia and this is Southern Hate Stories. This channel's a home for all the American Southern legends that I've gathered over the years that I want to share with you kind folks. But if you'd rather listen to my stories while y'all are stuck in traffic or doing a little book out, well, that's just fine by me. Won't y'all head on over to that old podcast player of yours and search for Southern Hate Stories there, or you can find all my tales at anchor.fm forward slash Southern Hate Stories. By the way, do you happen to have a local or regional hate story you want to share? I'm always looking for Southern tales to entertain y'all with, so if you're willing, won't you write me at dlumacavoy at gmail.com and let me know all about the ghosties in your garden. Maybe we can find a place for your story here on the channel sometime. 
And you know, I'd love to know what you think of Southern Hank stories, so won't you leave a comment or a review so y'all can help me build this into something we can all love and enjoy together. And while y'all are over that way, make sure you take a gander at the description of the channel's homepage and visit all the lovely individuals who help make Southern Hank stories possible. But mostly, I just want to thank y'all so very, very much for coming over and listening. I can't tell y'all how much it means to this old black soul of mine to share all these wonderful stories I grew up listening to with you kind people. Now go on and have a lovely day, you hear? But you better make sure you mosey on back over here in two weeks for another hate story to creep up under y'all's skin. <laughs>